Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by NatureBox. NatureBox ships great tasting, healthy snacks right to your door. Forget the vending machine and start snacking smarter with healthy, delicious treats like dark cocoa almonds. To get your free NatureBox sampler, go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's free NatureBox snacks at naturebox.com slash twit. On this episode of Know How the Hacks Are Among Us, you give me an SSD challenge, he's breaking out some Android foo, and, uh, oh, Linux tips number three. I contracted an SSD. <laughs> In Tijuana. We'll get this transition right with Josh. Wait, 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 wait. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballisere. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next uh, 30, 45, 50, maybe 60 minutes, we're going to be taking you through some of the projects that we've been working on the past few weeks so that you can take it, fill your knowledge hole, go home, and geek out. That's right. Because if there's one thing you should know about Know How, it's we're all about the knowledge hole. <laughs> and filling it and filling to it. the brim. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but today we have an interesting story. The hacks are we among us. We do. The hacks are definitely among us. So uh, this is something that we've been following for the last couple of weeks and uh, th there's, there's new news about it, which is why we're bringing, it, bringing oh. it up now. People who have been studying security have known for a while that it's actually pretty easy to intercept cell calls and cell data. Right. It's, it's, it's trivial. The, the gear is actually on the market. You can go buy yourself a set. I believe the proof of concept was first shown off, what, four years ago at mm -hmm. a DEF CON or a Black Hat. It, it, and quite simply, it means that you have someone who installs a piece of gear that pretends like it's, it's a cell, cell tower. tower. Right. And then isn't the gear getting cheaper and cheaper? The gear is getting cheaper and cheaper. Now, we'll yeah. talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to talk about what one company has done to combat it. Now, we've known that this is possible for the longest time, but there hasn't really been a good way to figure out if it's actually happening to you. Because to you... It, it seems like it's a normal use. Yeah, everything's working. Yeah. The calls go through. The data works. You can check your websites. Yeah. And supposedly, your phone, if you're using 3G or 4G, is encrypted, right. so you shouldn't have to worry. So, do you, you seem like you, there should be quotes there's, there's for that. Quote, yeah, yeah, there's definitely quotes there. <laughs> now, there, there's a company by the name of GSMK. It's a German okay. company. And they created a, it's kind of like the black phone, right? Right. A the, little higher end version, custom Android operating system. Everything's supposed to be locked super down. high end. Okay. Three thousand dollars a set. Whew. Yeah, a little, little on okay. the pricey side, but it has end-to-end -end encryption. And the idea is, from the phone all the way to the other side, it's supposed to be encrypted, so nothing should be able to break into the tunnel. And it uses just regular cell network and everything like that. Yes, but it, it runs a tunnel through them. Ah, uh, right, okay. right. So it'd be like running a VPN all the time, right. which we would actually suggest you do. Yeah, maybe we should start doing that with phones. Maybe we should, <laughs> but uh, but that's not the news. That's okay. so that's okay. you know, the sticker shock is cool. The news is that they developed a new software firewall for their phone, hmm. but it's not a firewall like you or I might be using. And when we think of firewall, we think of something on our like, router, right? Yeah, or like, yeah, on my PC or something. On your PC, it, it keeps malicious traffic from getting in or maybe getting out. Right. What theirs done, it does is it looks at the broadband. Uh, so in your, in your, um, your phone, the baseband, is a, uh, a, it's like a separate computer that controls how the phone communicates with the cell towers. Oh, right. It's like a whole other OS that runs on Yeah, yeah, exactly. And right. the operating system has no control over that baseband. It's not right. supposed to right. uh, because the baseband actually belongs to the cell, cell carriers. Mm -hmm. Your phone belongs to you. It's, it's that weird dichotomy. Yeah, very strange. Very strange. But what they've done is they've, they've created a piece of software that will actually look at any alterations that are being made to the baseband in real time. Wow, okay. And uh, they, they started rolling it out. They asked some of their customers to use it. And what they found out was that this GSM intercept problem mm -hmm. 
is actually much bigger than they thought. They found dozens of cell towers right. around the country. Fake cell towers. Fake cell towers. Right. I think they gave it like, oh, didn't they give them a name like Stingrays or something? Yeah, like yeah. Go ahead and scroll down a little bit, uh, uh, Josh, and you're going to see this map that. Uh, so yeah. these are these are customers of the companies who have reported. Yeah, I'm being. Uh, I, I, my phone is connecting to an interceptor. Right. Now, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Now, just because you're connecting to an interceptor doesn't necessarily mean that they're targeting you. It just means that they right. could target you, which is bad enough. But this is how it works. Your phone's actually stupid. It's really, really stupid. Mm -hmm. What it does is it connects to the strongest signal it can, which sounds like a good thing, right? Right, yeah. Now, it may, at any time, it may be tracking three, four, five, six different towers, and it will connect to the strongest one. Mm -hmm. But it knows that it could hand off to the other ones if that signal degrades to a certain point. Right, so if you're like moving or something if like that. If you're moving, if you're in a car, if, you're, if you go around a corner and suddenly you're, you've lost line of sight to one of them. But... People have figured out how to take advantage of that. What you do is you get your own cell tower, mm -hmm. uh, very cheap again, and you make it powerful. You make it really, really powerful. So your phone's going to go, oh, that one's the most powerful. I'm going to connect to that. It then relays your traffic back to a real tower. So again, you yeah. don't notice anything different. To right. you, it looks like it's totally OK. Mm -hmm. But now there's a man in the middle attack. There's there's yeah. a tower that you cannot trust. That's just like when you were explaining the the tap in, right. on a network. It's a tap. It's yeah. a tap. It just happens to be a wireless tap. Now here's the thing, the encryption that we love about our phones, right? So right. yeah, my call is encrypted. The call is encrypted between the phone and the tower. So once it gets to its destination, it... well, once it gets to the tower, it's no longer uh, encrypted. Right. So if they own the tower, it means they get they, all the yeah. unencrypted data. <laughs> uh, there's also a couple of other ways you can do this. Uh, okay. we, we, we played with this uh, at, a, at a DEF CON once. If you jam the frequencies that phones run on, uh, on 3G and 4G, it will default to 2G. That's also part of the, the, the set. That's what the, the, the baseband does. Right. The problem is 2G is not encrypted. So if they knock you off of 3G and 4G, your phone will default to 2G, which I can use a standard software-defined radio to listen in on. It okay. just, it'd be just like listening to a CB conversation. Now, wouldn't you notice if your phone got knocked down to 2G? You would, but most of the time people don't care because <laughs> it happens so often, right? I mean, right. It's, if you're using a carrier that doesn't have great service, yeah. you might wander between 3G, 4G, and Edge. You just go back and forth. Yeah. But again, as long as you've got your call, you don't care. So right. you don't notice. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of scary. It's kind of scary. Now, this, this, uh, this company, this German company, the software will tell you if the encryption has been turned off. It will tell you if you're connecting to a known rogue uh, cell tower. And it will also tell you if you're connecting to a cell tower that doesn't have an identifier that says, I'm AT&T, or I'm Verizon, or I'm Sprint, or I'm hmm. T-Mobile. Uh, which all those towers should have. So that's what pops up on the screen? That's what pops up on the screen. Now, uh, that's, that's, he, here's the problem. That's crazy expensive. Right, that that phone and the software and everything. That that is crazy expensive. Yeah. Uh, the other problem is they could make alterations to your baseband. We also did a proof of concept for at DefCon for do, for doing that. So if you do connect to a rogue cell tower, they could change the firmware, which again you have no control over. Your operating system can't touch. So that maybe even after you start running a VPN tunnel, it still could report back. Oh to wow. Yeah, so that's another so thing to get paranoid about. When are we going to start using cans and string again? I know, tell me about <laughs> no. Well, especially since the equipment has gotten so cheap. When, we, when they did the proof of concept, the gear cost something like $7,000. So it was, it was cost prohibitive. Right. You can now buy a, a setup that will do it for under a grand. I saw the one you showed me, yeah. and that was... It was about $1,000. $1, yeah, yeah. But, and it wasn't that sophisticated. It can't do all the super decryption stuff that you would... Mm -hmm. You would still need like a three to $4,000 rig to be able to do that. But the fact that people can buy these, I mean, there's, there's outfits that sell fully configured GSM catchers. Yeah. Uh, and like, <laughs> what? This, this is kind of funny. At DEF CON, people have a picture. There's a tower right above the Rio. Yeah. People have video and photos of, at the start of the conference, for some reason, someone in kind of a janky technician's outfit <laughs> was climbing the tower and was up there for like two hours installing hmm. something. And people were like, oh, yeah, phone goes off. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So and, <laughs> Those kind of situations too is like, if the person looks like they know what they're kind of doing. Right, no, it's like, well, he's got people, a clipboard. Yeah, must, yeah no problem. Fine. So I, I, th I think the, the, what we're trying to say is, uh, yeah, don't, don't use your cell phone. <laughs> Just don't.
<laughs> Anything that it, digitally that you use, just it, just turn it off. Turn it off. So all those nude photos that I Done. Had recently, Done. yours yeah. got hacked and someone deleted them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 someone it, broke into my cloud storage account and, where I keep all my nude photos, right. and they deleted them. And they, they're doing you a favor. They're like, ah! <laughs> All right, no, no. Uh, let, let's Those get to, can't get out. Let's get to something serious. Uh, mm. We actually got a a really good question from a member of uh, of chat room uh, from from the Google Plus group. Uh, go ahead and, and run the video for this uh, for this question, Josh. Sean B from Texas said, uh, "You gave the Toshiba Tecra W50 a don't buy in episode 136 of Before You Buy because it uses a hard disk drive instead of a solid state drive." In the comment, you suggested that Toshiba sacrifice 55% of the laptop's performance for a 3% decrease in price. That doesn't sound right. Even without an SSD, the W50 has a super fast CPU, GPU, and lots of memory. Cannot having an SSD really cripple a modern laptop by 50%? Uh, Sean, we want to thank you. And he, he says, by the way, he's from the great state of Texas. I, I messed this up at the beginning. I guess there's... <laughs> I didn't know they called themselves the great state. I thought well, it was I, the Lone Star State, but okay. No, no, no Sean. No. Sean's right. Uh, now, <laughs> Depends he, the, on which part. The, yeah, the, the calculus <laughs> that I used was actually pretty simple. The, mm -hmm. the base price of a Toshiba Tecra W50 is $2,250. Okay. Right? Uh, the difference in price between the 500 gigabyte hard drive that they have in there mm -hmm. and this uh, 240 gigabyte SSD from Kingston was about $60 which would have been a 3% increase in price over the base price of, right. of, the, uh, of the laptop. And I said, well, you know, that's like a 50% uh, performance difference. And he called me on it. And, you know, this, this oh. is actually, this goes, okay. this, this is good logic. He's saying even though it has a slow hard drive, it's still got a super fast processor. It's still got a ton of memory. Right. It still has a crazy fast <laughs> GPU. So he doesn't see how that could possibly account for a 50% loss of performance. Well, you just had to find out, thanks. I, I did have <laughs> to find out. And uh, so uh, here's how we tested. How did we test? Uh, <laughs> that's for our upgrade, I chose the Kingston KC300 upgrade kit. It's not the fastest SSD on the market or in Kingston's arsenal of SSDs, but it has a high price performance ratio and is my personal favorite in terms of reliability and performance over time. In upgrading the hard drive of a computer to an SSD, many kits, like the Kingston KC300, includes gear that allows you to clone the drive using the previous installation copied to the SSD, complete with your data, programming, and settings. While it's a tempting solution, I don't recommend it. A fresh, lean operating system is the way to go. Why spoil a new, crazy fast piece of hardware with an installation that may be... crapified? The first step is to make Restore Media for your operating system if you don't already have it. Many laptops, especially Windows 7 laptops, do not come with Restore Media, but instead have an application that allows you to create them as needed. In our case, the Toshiba Tecra W50 requires four DVD-Rs for the full set. Luckily, the W50 has an internal optical drive to burn those DVDs, but if you have a laptop without an optical drive, you'll need an external drive to complete the Restore set or, as is the case with many Windows 8 laptops, a USB drive large enough to contain the entire Restore image. With the Restore Media on hand, shut everything down and pull your old drive, replacing it with your SSD of choice. Here's where the upgrade kit comes in handy even if you're not going to clone your old drive. The Kingston KC300 includes a USB 3.0 enclosure originally intended to allow you to clone the SSD before installation. This enclosure doubles as a permanent case for your old hard disk drive allowing you to retrieve your files after the upgrade. After the reinstallation of the OS and our benchmarking tool, PC Mark Vantage, it's time to see what kind of performance boost we can get from our Tecra. The stock Toshiba Tecra W50 with its 500GB 5400RPM hard drive scored 9,967 on PC Mark Vantage. With the Kingston KC300 upgrade, but everything else exactly the same, including the operating system, the W50 scored... 24,262. The price of a Toshiba Tucker W50? 2250. Price of a 240 gigabyte Kingston KC300 SSD kit? 110. Boosting the performance of your laptop a whopping 243% in an hour? Priceless. 
<laughs> so Sean was absolutely right. It wasn't 3% price for a 55% You're increase. Right. Right. It was 3% price difference for a 59% performance <laughs> increase. And it's, <laughs> it was a it's, little bit of a difference. 240, 249% the performance of the original setup, which, again, th that's one of the weird things. This is why I gave this a don't buy. It's a decent laptop. It's yeah, actually a good price point. hardware specs are up there. It's crazy. In fact, with the SSD, it is the fastest of the three that I tested from, from Toshiba, Dell, and HP. Yeah, so you're really you're doing a disservice to the hardware when you don't have it's an SSD in there. Huge disservice. And again, you know, SSDs aren't that expensive. Now, the only thing I can figure is this is a Toshiba hard drive. So maybe they had a bunch of... Hard drives they needed <laughs> to get around. rid of. Yeah, they need like, to Like, hey, what are we going to do? Oh, I know, shove it into our performance hard drive, uh, our performance laptop. Well, I like the little enclosure you have for it, too, so yeah. that way you can still use it. And, yeah. And you give your laptop a performance boost. That That's why I buy the kits, even though I don't, I don't use them to clone. I, again, uh, I've said this to you several times. I've said this to the audience several times. Mm -hmm. If you're going to install an SSD, don't clone. If, if, there, if you can help it at all, don't, don't clone. clone yeah. Do a fresh installation. You're going to find out that so many of the problems that you thought you had right. were just like the crapification of your OS. That, yeah. yeah, which it tends to happen over time. And I, I like that feeling of a fresh install every like year or so. Right, right. right. And it also kind of helps you remember, oh, yeah. What, what setting did I need? I need this? Oh, this is a much better way. Every time I do a fresh installation, I always find a better way to do it. Um, and I kind of like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's also, the, uh, you know, after like coming back from DEF CON, yeah, mm -hmm. you have to reinstall. <laughs> yeah, that's what you told me. You completely yeah. wiped everything. Phone, two laptops. That might not have walked. been enough either. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this was a bad year for DEF CON Black Hat. Like, between the bad USB and the phone hack, it's like, uh, just not feeling it. Well, I mean, fortunately, I don't have anything that I really need to hide, but it's scary that those things are so easily uh, circumvented. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, now that uh, we've talked all about SSDs, and you know now that you need to get an SSD, because remember, friends don't let friends use hard disk drives. No. I, I want to talk about something else that you're going to need in your Uber Geek lifestyle. Not just fast computers, but snacks. Oh, yeah. Brian, you know all about snacks, right? Oh, I know about snacks. Yeah. Now, I get tempted with snacks of the wrong kind. If you go to our snack room here at Twit, you're going to find that we have a lot of chocolate. We have a lot of sugar, processed yeah. sugar. Yeah. We, we have a lot of chips. Yeah. I kind of lived on those for a while. <laughs> But that's not good well, for you. Well, say chips or go to the grocery store. That's I'm going to go gonna with chips. chips. They're right we, here. But that is exactly why I'm so happy that we've got NatureBox as a sponsor on the Twit TV network because NatureBox gave us a healthy alternative to snacking. And, I mean, it, it's not like, oh, have a tofu cake, have some rice. No, this, these are really, really good. I, I've kind of got a addict. Is, wait, is it, tell me, is it, are the Santa Fe corn sticks in here? Hey, get, you know what? Could yeah. you just these, lay off no, some of them? These are mine. These are mine. These some are mine. people would like to try them. No, they can't ones. have them. Now, now we've, been, uh, we've been eating NatureBox for a while, and what we like about them is that there's nothing artificial in there. There's no GMOs. There's no high fructose corn food. syrup. Tastes good, and it's good for you. Exactly. Now, uh, we, we understand that some people may be reluctant, because you've probably been bitten mm -hmm. by snack boxes before that promise to give you healthy benefits, and they end up just being more of the same. That's not the case with NatureBox. We've had them for months, and these have become the de facto standard yeah. for how we snack. Uh, so here's what we want to do. We want to give you a way to get a nature box of your own, but, but check this out. It, it's not 10% off. It's not 50% off. We want to get it to you absolutely free. NatureBox has hundreds of delicious snacks, and right now they'll give you a sampler box featuring five of their most popular snacks gratis for nothing. What? Free, just for trying NatureBox. And I, I promise you, once you try them, you're going to love them. They've got those zero artificial in ingredients, the zero trans fats, the zero high fructose corn syrup, mm -hmm. but so much flavor. You want something sweet, you want something spicy, you want something savory, mm -hmm. you're going to find it in their selection. You'll even find snacks that are low in sugar and gluten-free. Which is something that I'm concerned, not the gluten so much, but as a type 1 diabetic, I like to drill down into the snacks that don't have a lot of sugar in them, but I can still munch on you know, when I'm sitting at the computer <laughs> more often than I should. But. Well, Brian, munch all you like, because when you get to that afternoon spot where you just want to eat something, you can dig into a nature box mm. knowing that it's not going to drive you into a diabetic coma. <laughs> That's probably not the best endorsement we've ever made of a product, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's but actually important. I don't want to go into a diabetic coma, really so. <laughs> so folks, 
If you haven't tried NatureBox, you're missing out. Make sure to go to NatureBox.com, mm -hmm. check them out, and see if maybe this is going to be your next. Why did you take my Santa Fe corn sticks? Because uh, I'm going to toss this. You are a bad man. <laughs> Start your free trial today and get a free sampler box at NatureBox.com slash twit. That's NatureBox.com slash twit. Stay full. Stay strong. Start snacking smarter. Go to NatureBox.com slash twit. And we thank NatureBox for their support of know-how. You are going to give me those sticks back, right? Later. In the no-hole. But they're well-packaged, too. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you just like having NatureBox as a sponsor because you like throwing the product at the end. Bad man. Well, folks, uh, we promised, and uh, you edited together so we can deliver. Oh, yeah. Here is Aaron Newcomb with Linux Tips Part 3. Hi, I'm Aaron Newcomb, back for another segment on Linux. Last time we looked at uh, the different types of operating systems. We looked at how to prepare your desktop laptop for a Linux installation and the different types of installation methods, be it USB drive, CD-ROM, um, or just run it in VirtualBox, which is also works really well. So today we're actually going to get on with the Linux installation. So this is step three. Uh, so this will be a really fun episode. But before we get started, I want to show you a little bit about um, what it was like back in the day. And maybe this is what you're thinking your experience will be like. So these nice little blue screens were around back in the 90s. This is from uh, Red Hat 5.1, um, which was around back in the uh, early 90s, or excuse me, late 90s. And this is how you would do the install. You'd go through these DOS menus, uh, DOS-like menus, and uh, there was no real GUI. It was all laid out with ASCII code. And uh, Disk Druid was the big thing for preparing your your partitions on your system. If you remember Disk Druid, you're a, a uh, blood brother of mine for sure. Um, it was it was difficult to say the least. Uh, there were some cool things about it and it worked really well. Um, never had a problem, but maybe that's what you're thinking the installation is going to be like. Not so. Uh, the installation for Linux has come a long way. So it's a lot more like a Windows or Mac OS installation. Let's go ahead and take a look. We'll pick right back up where we left off. Uh, we actually uh, shrunk down our partition to make room for our Linux installation. So in your case, this may have taken a little while. Again, word of caution, if you're going to try these steps at home, make sure you know what you're doing. You could overwrite your system information and have a bad day or several bad days. Uh, but if you were following along, this should have gone through very smoothly. And now you're done and you have this unallocated space that you're going to use for the installation. Now, if you're running this off of the Linux Mint installation disk, installation is very easy. All you have to do is double click on this little icon over here. We're actually gonna go ahead and shut down Gparted in our terminal window. Here's the uh, install icon to install Linux Mint. You just double click on that. Very easy and you'll see that the um, uh, install screen will pop up here momentarily and we'll get on our way. Now I'm gonna explain all of these steps so, because some of these can be confusing if you're not familiar with how a computer works yet, or you're not too sure, haven't done this before, we're gonna step through all these options. Some of them are easy. Like the first option, choose your language, right? There's no question about that. Uh, choose your language that you speak and hit continue, very easy. Um, and then we'll get to the second step, which is usually, here it is. So, it's gonna ask you, and this is great, it's gonna ask you, number one, are you ready to do this? So do you have enough space available? Yes, we do. Are you plugged into a power source? Obviously that's crucial because if you lose power in the middle of your install, things are not gonna go well. And are you connected to the internet? Because one thing that the install is gonna do is it's gonna go out and look for upgraded software to install on your system as it's installing um, the operating system. That way you're, you're ready to go right out of the box. Um, we're not gonna worry about the fact that we're not plugged in because that's the way I roll. Um, so we'll go ahead and hit continue. Now, here's the critical piece, right? Here's the installation type. This is asking, where do you want to install Linux Mint? And the default option is erase the disk and install Linux Mint. That means if you have Windows or Mac installed on your desktop or laptop, it's going to get rid of that. And we don't wanna do that. We actually wanna install this alongside of our existing installation, which is called dual booting. So we're gonna choose something else and we're gonna hit continue. This is gonna bring up some options. This is where we'll need a little bit of explanation as to what's going on. Now, as you can see, we have the uh, free space that we made earlier for this installation. Basically with this, uh, this, we have a disk, 
right here. This slash dev SDA represents our hard drive that we're installing this on. And you see there's a one entry underneath that called NTFS. That would be where your Windows installation would be. Um, we're imagining that this is a Windows installation and we don't want to use that, but we want to install this alongside our Windows installation. So we're going to use this free space that we created earlier. So we're going to click on that free space and we're going to hit the plus sign and we're going to add a place for our Windows operating system to live. Um, so this is asking us, do you want to use all the space? Well, in this case, actually, we don't. <laughs> you may be asking why. I'll get to that in a minute. We're going to actually um, we're going to actually subtract some space here. We've got 10 gig on which to install, and we will uh, maybe back off a little bit on that. Um, take it down to something a little less than than 10 gig. So we'll um, we'll make it 10 gig exactly. Now don't complain at me. I know that's not 10 gig exactly for those that like to crunch the numbers. Um, but let's just go ahead and call it um, 10,000 megabytes. Um, and then we will leave everything else default and we will create, we'll say, where do we want to, how do we want this to look to our operating system? That's the mount point. Now, if you're familiar with Windows, you're familiar with the fact that you have a C drive and a D drive, maybe a D drive, or when you plug in a USB stick, maybe that becomes your E drive or F drive, whatever. Basically, in the Linux world, the mount point is the same as the C drive or D drive. It's basically saying, you know, where do you want, when I make this available, where do you want it to live or what do you want it to look like? In this case, we want this to be the very root of our file system, of our installation. So we want that to be slash, just plain old slash. Think of it as C colon on a Windows system. All right, so we're going to say OK to that. It's going to make some configuration changes, not permanently, but it's just thinking about, OK, do we have everything we need? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, so it's, you'll see it'll update here in just a minute. OK, so that left us with a little bit of additional free space. Now, uh, here's why we did that. We actually also need some swap space. And I won't go into all the definitions of what that means, but essentially what it is, it's a little bit of extra space on the disk so that if your system runs out of memory, it can spill over and use some of that hard drive space, just like it was memory. The reason that's important is because if you don't have that, your system crashes. We don't want that. So let's select that additional free space and hit the plus sign again. And we will configure this. Uh, you can leave all the defaults there because we're going to use the rest of that space. But we want to configure this as swap area. So just select swap area and hit OK. Typically, you want at least as much swap space as you have memory in your system. Um, and uh, I would recommend actually two times as much swap space as you have memory. Those are the guidelines. OK, so now we're ready to install. So we'll hit Install Now. And as it's installing, I'll explain a few more changes that will happen. So one thing that's going to happen during the installation, you'll notice this says the device for bootloader installation. What's that? The bootloader is actually when the computer starts up, it looks for a bootloader to tell it how to, how to run the operating system. How do you want to start this thing up? And bootloaders are built into Windows, they're built into Mac OS, and there's one built into Linux. The nice thing about the one that's built into Linux is that it will um, boot other operating systems as well. So if you're using the Linux bootloader, it will know to boot Windows or Mac OS if you already have that installed on your device. Now again, have to be a little careful here. You might want to do some, some reading up on how to dual boot before you get into this process, just to make sure you don't run into any gotchas. Um, I would highly recommend doing a little bit of research in that area, but in general, this should work. All right, now there's a few more configuration options we have to step through. Things like time zone. We'll go ahead and click Los Angeles. Even though we're in San Francisco. You can see these configuration options, options just take a few seconds. Um, it's going to detect our keyboard layout. Which keyboard? It should auto-detect the keyboard layout you have. But if you are going to use a different type of keyboard, you can change that. Shouldn't have to change it. And then we get to throw in our personal information. Ask for your name. And it will automatically suggest a computer name. We'll just go ahead and leave that for now because I don't really care what you call it. But if you want to change that to something else, you absolutely can and pick a username. I am going to change that because um, 
my fingers are programmed to type in a Nukem. So I'm going to put that there. And then to choose, you can also put a password in. I would highly recommend doing that. But for purposes of this demonstration, I am not going to put a password in and I am going to say log in automatically. Very insecure, but um, it'll just save us some steps later on. Actually, we may not be able to do that. So I'll put in a password. There we go. It actually is requiring me to put in a password. Um, in this case, my password is password. I never use that anywhere else. Feel free to try to hack my systems. All right. So now we are, um, it's still installing. The nice thing about this is all these little configuration options are happening while the system is installing on your computer. So um, it's a little bit of a time saver because you get to do all those last minute configuration steps while it's installing. In fact, you can see here that we're almost halfway through um, the installation. We're uh, uh, just about halfway there. So I think what we'll do is we'll take a break and let this thing churn for a while and come back when we're ready to rock and roll. All right, so after about 10 minutes, our installation is complete. Uh, there's some nice little welcome screens, um, on the little information about the operating system and so forth that goes on while the installation is happening. And then after it downloads some updates and, and does the final configuration, it comes back and says, hey, you can stick with this live CD if you want. Uh, but really what you want to do is restart so you can get in and start customizing your operating system. So let's go ahead and restart. And we'll take a look at what it looks, what your system looks like when it reboots. So we are going to restart. And when your computer reboots, it will come up and you'll see the Linux Mint uh, icon as it loads. Now, if you had a another operating system, if you were dual booting, uh, we don't have a real operating system installed in that first partition. Uh, but if you did, you would actually come up with a, a screen where you could choose to boot up into that operating system and to boot up into Windows or to boot up into Linux Mint. And you would see that as a choice on your screen. But as it is, we really only have Linux Mint install. We were just pretending about all that Windows stuff. Um, so it's going to go ahead and boot up into Linux Mint, and we'll see what this looks like. Ta -da! There it is. So we'll dismiss this little message that came up. This is actually uh, because we are running in VirtualBox to show this off. So now it looks just like the installation CD, but this is actually uh, this is actually running the full version of Linux Mint. The nice thing about this is, I told you it was very user-friendly, and it is, because look, it gives you all of these helpful tips. It's like, what do you want to do? Um, you know, do you want to learn about the new features in this version? Do you want to chat with people? What do you want to do? And you can click on these and get more information or launch those applications um, if you're unfamiliar with how Linux works or just what some of these things are. We're going to go ahead. We don't want this to come up every time, so we're going to dismiss this screen, um, and I'm going to... Uh, pause right there because what we're going to do in the next segment, I'm going to walk you through some of the applications that are uh, installed by default so you know what those are. But then we're going to also show you how to upgrade your software and install new applications, things that you might want to run and you might not see already loaded on your system. If you have questions about running Linux, maybe there's something we're not covering and you're really interested to find out or you've always wondered, how do I do this in Linux? Things like, oh, I don't know. How do I know which the best, which is the best HTPC software for me? I'd really like to set something up like this in my living room. Or maybe it's, how do I do video editing on Linux? Or something even simpler. Maybe it's just, well, I just want to run Notepad or maybe some Office applications. If you've got a task that you've always wondered, how does it work in Linux, let us know. Just go to our Google Plus page uh, for Know How and type in your question. And we'll see if we can get your question answered in one of the future segments. Thanks to Aaron Newcomb for yeah. that. It, actually, you know, it, it takes a while, but once you get into it, Mint Linux is pretty good. He, he, mm -hmm. he converted me. I was stuck on Ubuntu. I was like, Ubuntu is the thing for beginners, but Mint is, is a pretty good alternative. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate him coming up and doing that. And uh, having worked with him on that, it inspired me to install VirtualBox on my computer, and I installed Kali Linux, um, yeah, which is a, yeah. another flavor. So there's so many different kinds of Linux that you can try out. Uh, that's That can be the daunting thing, because once you, once you start looking at the different distros, they yeah. all have strengths and weaknesses, but you got to start someplace, yeah. and that's why Aaron gave us Mint. Well, I think everybody who watches this show likes to tinker with stuff. We like to know how things work. Yes, we do. Uh, and, and depends on what you're looking for. But 
segue into our next segment. Uh, if you like to tinker, and that's part of the reason why I have Let's an Android phone. Let's do some tinkering. Yeah. So you use an Android phone. Right? I do. And I use an Android phone. I you played do. with. I mean, I don't. I'm not partial to any certain mobile OS, but uh, I like to mess around with my phone, and Android allows me the most flexibility to do that. And I've got a couple of tips that maybe maybe you've heard about if you use an Android phone, but we'll go go into it a little bit. Uh, so if you go to my overhead shot here, Josh. Um, so if you got an Android phone and you kind of want to get into the guts of it, kind of see some some geeky stats and things like that. Um, a little trick is you can go into your settings, go down to about your phone. Now, I've already done this, so it's not going to do anything different. But if you tap the build number seven times, it'll pop up with a little message. So I've already done it, but it's so it says, no need, you are already a developer. I'm not a developer, but shh, don't tell my phone that. <laughs> um, but so then if you do that and you back out, you'll have this option here for developer options which just basically lets you kind of go through some different options, a lot of which you probably won't mess around with anyway. Um, but it's got some nerdy stuff that you can kind of go through, um, see some things that are uh, going on in the background on your phone. Like what was the one I was looking at earlier? Oh, process stats, geeky stats about running processes. You know, just some nerdy stuff. Like I could see Netflix is what's been sucking up a lot of my background uh energy and stuff at the moment what else yeah, facebook Ooh, oh, I I know, the, stop you these developer options were were, des were created because people who are actually creating applications for Warning. android need access to this kind of information like for example there's a there's a thing there for allowing mock locations for mm -hmm. gps so if you were creating a gps dependent application this would allow you to say okay Will the app crash if it's San Francisco? Will the right. app crash if it's in New York? Will you wouldn't app... use that for Ingress, though, would you? Uh, well, you could, <laughs> but then Ingress would ban you. And right. they should ban you because you're a now bad how person. How did he jump from one side of the city to the other right. side of the he city? He was just in San Francisco. Yeah. Now, how is he in London 30 minutes later? I don't understand that. It just that. doesn't make yeah. any sense. Yeah, so, so don't, um, yeah, you're not going to get a, an advantage on any GPS caching games. Right. But if you are developing an app, you can figure out how your app will actually work in different parts of the world without having to actually travel to different parts of the world. It's just some of the nerdy stuff that I like to look at uh, when I mess around with, with my phone. There's shows CPU usage. Got some cool dialogue stuff going on the side there. Um, but one of the things that it can make your phone feel a little bit more snappy is you can change the, uh, the animation scale. Oh, yeah. So what that means is that the Instead of the normal rate, which is one times, you could set it to 0.5. And that'll make the animations, when they pop open, faster. So it just it can make your phone feel a lot snappier. Right. Just by, and then you could also turn off animations completely, which would just make them pop up. Right. And that's because in Android, it's actually drawing the animations in real time right. versus uh, iOS does a slightly different way. They, they've, they've got an interesting method where, mm. like, when you flip through pages, it's not the page that's being rendered in real time, it's actually right. a picture of the page, and which then, they're flipping, right? Yeah. Which, which actually does decrease the, the dependence on the GPU. It's a really good way to do it. Right. Android took a different track. Everything that you see is being generated in real time. So if you turn that off, that's that much processing power that doesn't need to be used. Yeah, so just a cool little setting. And we've been, so we've been talking a lot of stuff about um, cloud. Cluster. Yeah, yeah. And when I was looking uh, just this week, or maybe it was last week on All About Android, we found an app about managing some of your cloud services. Um, and there's this app that we came across called Un Unclouded. Cl Unclouded. So this is a nifty little app that allows you to sync your Dropbox and Google Drive at the moment. So I've got both of those synced up here. And it just it gives you a nice little UI of how much of your Dropbox you're using. And you can drill down into Explorer mode, see all the different um, folders that you have on your in your Dropbox or whatever. And it's just a it's a neat little app to kind of tie your your cloud services together, which can kind of get you know, if you have more than one cloud service, it can kind of get irritating and trying to figure out how much space you have left. Right. And one of the features of the app that I really liked was um, it'll show you if you have duplicate files, which... Uh, which is awesome. Yeah. If you're, if, we're, if you're one of these people who juggles a lot of different cloud services, yeah. the duplicates can be deadly. I've seen yes. this happen to people before where they have different revisions 
And then at, they're like, oh, well, this is the same, so I'll delete right. one. And they delete the wrong one. And they go, ah! Yeah. A, a good duplication app will actually tell you, this one's newer. Mm -hmm. This one's been accessed more recently, so which one do you want to keep? Right. And the thing I've done before is I've backed up, I back up my photos to Google Plus and so my Google Drive and my Dropbox. So I have like double ba cloud backup for my photos. But sometimes I'll just, all right, it's like, okay, I have more space on my Google Drive. I'll just move all my backup to Google Drive from Dropbox and then delete the ones on Dropbox. But sometimes I'll forget. And then this has showed me, it's like, oh, why do I have two backups of the same group of cell phone photos? Um, so that was the cloud services. And then, oh, the last one I wanted to show was that if you've been using an Android phone, I've been using Android for like the last four years or so. Every app you've ever downloaded is saved to the store. And so if you've ever, you know, got a new phone. Oh, I hate you, that. You sign into your Google account. And it, you, you, re you realize all the crappy apps you've added and deleted oh, from your phone but yeah. did not delete from the store. I had something called Leet, like Leet Xbox Live or something. It, it was when Android first came out. Right. It was the only app that let you look at your friends list for Xbox Live or something. It, it, I, it's terrible. It was terrible. But so if you have a new phone and you sign in with your, your account, it's going to try and install all those apps that you've ever downloaded. But what you can do is go into the store, my apps. You used to be able to do this through the web interface, but you can only do it through the phone now, so it's kind of a pain. But you can go through your apps and delete them, the ones that, if you go to all. So this shows every app I've ever downloaded for my phone. Now, it might take a while, but you can, I've cleaned them out. I don't think, I don't know if I have any apps that aren't installed. Well, let's get rid of this one. I don't use this one. No. <laughs> Uninstall TwitPro. I am going to reinstall this one. I really do like TwitPro. Um, but for demonstration purposes, so see how I have that X there now? If I were to reinstall, uh, if I were to format my phone, it would try and install all these apps, but I don't want TwitPro to install when I do my new phone and stuff. So. I'm going to just remove it from the list. And now, now that I've cleaned out my whole like app drawer of every app that I've ever had, I, I, don't, I feel like I could have a new phone, sign in, and then just let everything update and not worry about like yeah. apps that I don't and, want. And this is actually really good best practices because you do want to go through your list of applications every once in a while and say, Clear it out. I, I'm not using this anymore, or I don't want this to install on my new tablet, yeah. which Google, if you sign in with your Google services account, will automatically try to do. You can stop it. Like, you can say, no, 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 no. But, but you, no yeah. one wants to do that. You want to say, OK, sign in. Now go do your thing for the next right. 30 minutes. So I've, I've gone through my list of apps. I've gone through, these are like the core apps that I really like. And I have installed at the moment, so I feel safe that if I had a new phone, I could I could have all the apps that I want without it just like downloading everything I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, that's that's actually I think that's a lot of information between the SSD upgrade, your apps, and uh, and Aaron explaining how to get Mint installed on your computer. I I think we can call it an episode. I hope so. Yeah. Was that, how many hours was yeah, that that's, just now? It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, we understand that that is a lot of information. So if you want any of our show notes, you want to find out where we're getting our SSDs, you want to find out exactly how we install them, you want to find out some of the interesting things that we learned about installing an SSD on a Toshiba W50, or maybe going through Linux tips or Brian's application tips, you got to go to our show notes page. Brian, where can they find that? Ooh, that would be twit.tv slash kh. And it's not just where our show notes are. You can subscribe and download any of our prior episodes. Uh, we have a lot of information there. So there's definitely something that's going to strike your fancy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for example, like if, you, if you're worried about your, uh, your cloud storage, as, as you were, mm. why not check out last week's episode about the super backup where we showed people <laughs> how they could use Amazon Glacier yeah. along with a, a very simple script and a very cheap computer to make sure that all their cloud storage gets backed up to a place where it's untouchable. It doesn't matter if someone violates your cloud storage, you would still... <laughs> have it that's true although that's it true. wouldn't keep them from actually getting the data I mean, look Just at those show it. notes in there those are that's a beautiful thing right that's there. what that's what we do after the, each show also you could find us on the social don't try to email us because we're not going to respond but if you go to our g plus group just uh, drop into google plus and go ahead and look for the know-how community join us and you'll find not only is it a good place to 
ask questions, but it's a good place for more experienced users to give answers. It's a free sharing of information. It's a lot of fun, and it's just a really good place to geek out. Yeah, and if you've ever tried any of the projects we've done, we'd love to see you post pictures of that. Or um, we like that. The, the, my favorite one is the NES and how the guy actually yeah. made like a 3D printed structure for it, and it was actually it was way better. It's a lot better than like glue gun and and the tape. Dremel tool Dremel, I think that yeah, we used. The 3D print. <laughs> 3D, yeah, please. Uh, also, you can find us on Twitter if you're not into the G plus vibe. You can find me at twitter.com/padresj. That's the little at. Padre SJ. And I'm at cranky underscore hippo. Yeah. Uh, don't forget that we tape this show live every Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. If you drop in, you'll see the pre show, the post show, you'll see all the bloopers that we have to take out of there's the final few. cut. There's, 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 every once there's in a always, while. yeah. <laughs> Normally we're pretty perfect, but every yeah, once in a job, while we Josh. do mess up. Josh good job, filling Josh. in today for Alex, mm -hmm. who's still having fun in Seattle after Yeah. Back, so. Yeah. Uh, Alex, come back soon. Fast. All right. Hey. <laughs> no, just kidding. Oh. No, Al Josh, Josh, great, you did great a good job. job. Don't press the delete button. Also, <laughs> right. also, you're going to find that we have a chat room at irc.twit.tv. If you jump in there while in the live show, you could be part of some actual incredible discussions, like uh, from Titus, who wants to know, why are we so boring? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't hurt. <laughs> that Grummer. and other gems will be Grummer found. who says LOL. LOL. I mean, that's a good sign. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go do it. Thank you.